Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Mind Muscle Connection podcast. Today, I have a very special guest back on the podcast, Dr. Eric Helms. This is his third time back on, and I was looking before we hopped on when he was on in episode 190. We talked about uh, body fat set point, weight gain for muscle growth, and we had a couple other hypertrophy related topics in there. And then on, in episode 258, we chatted about pre, intra, and post workout nutrition for muscle growth and some of your training as well, which I want to dive into today. So, uh, Dr. Helms, thank you for coming back on today. Repeat, man. I feel privileged and honored. Thank you. Yep. The three P baby. Yeah. Uh, your episodes always get great feedback and I'm not surprised. Obviously I've, I've talked about in the previous episodes with you. I've looked up to you and you have a ton of great research that you put out and obviously you break down the research. So it's awesome to uh, have you on here and be able to chat with you about these things. And like I said, off air, I want to almost do a state of the union for hypertrophy research uh, with you just to see where everything's at and get your thoughts on some of the new stuff coming out. But before we dive into that, I know that last time we chatted, you were saying that you were getting ready for a powerlifting competition. You were prepping for a bodybuilding competition. And I think this was a new thing for you here to do, to do both at the same time, or, or maybe you had done it one other time. Um, but either, either way, I'm curious to hear how that's going and where you're out there with that. Yeah. So I started my contest prep in February. My shows are basically all happening from September 30th until WNBF Worlds in Seattle on November 18th. So kicking off on September 30th, I'm competing every weekend, every other weekend. And then before World Worlds, there's a three week stint. So I'm doing five shows in that period. Stage weight is tip, or I should say my low early morning weigh-ins will probably dip down to 80 kilos or even slightly under if I really try to get uh, conditioning PR, which is just going to be like gross, perfect for the stage. And I had a wild idea starting back in February. And the reason why I say it's wild is because the whole year prior, my off season was very bodybuilding focused to jump into a powerlifting meet. So when I started the prep in Feb, I said, you know what, let me throw in some kind of low volume specific work on top of my, my, my bodybuilding training, like some minimum effective dose stuff. And I, knowing that this would not be optimal because I didn't have, I wasn't like at my peak strength capacity, but it went really well. I competed just at the North Island Championships here in New Zealand, which is like a sub-national level event and in the 83 kilo class, because that's where I'm at. So we're into July. I've still got more dieting to do. I started around 96, but I'm all the way down to 83 now, 83, 84, first thing in the morning and depleted 82 something. That's right around 180 pounds for the Imperial listeners. And yeah, the cool thing about it was that while this wasn't, I wasn't able to increase strength to the point where I was as strong as I was at 93 when I've been training for powerlifting for specifically for a year or so with bodybuilding on the back burner. It's like the opposite, basically. My strength was completely maintained and actually improved on the platform for my squat and my deadlift. So the heaviest I squatted, including when I was at 96, starting in February until now was 200 kilos, which is like 441 pounds. And the heaviest I deadlifted was like 230, which is 507 or something like that. But in my meet, I did 205. So that's another five kilos or 11 pounds. I did 235, another five kilos or 11 pounds on top of that. And on both of those, I had a little bit of room. So it maybe could have gone 240 on the deadlifts and 207 on squats or something like that. It went really well. And the only lift that I actually knew where my top end was it was my bench because that tends to suffer the most with body weight loss. I actually had to stop benching in my squat shoes and bench in my deadlift shoes just so that my, my butt wasn't elevated because my normal leg drive just decreases the amount of butt squish. But when I'm this lean, it actually gets me like a millimeter off the bench. It's hard being six foot with a shredded booty. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, the, the bench press basically dropped like from 145-ish or 320 when I started the prep down to just around like 300 and I couldn't quite get 135 or 297 on the platform because I made a technical error, but it was a really successful prep. And I really have not been really feeling the diet with the strategy. I took a diet break week of and did a deload, like a taper week of, and then just did a bit of a gut cut, just manipulating fiber and, and gut content. So I didn't have to dehydrate, carb deplete, or even diet the week of the meet, which really helped performance on game day. So long and the short of it is I'm actually considering maybe intentionally doing this instead of doing it in route to bodybuilding and see if I can hang around like 85, 86 and then cut down. We'll just have to see how my body responds post recovery after this season and seeing if that's too lean for me to hang around or not, which we'll find out. Yeah. So really what it sounds like there is you, it, it sounds like you're at the lower body weight and performance didn't suffer. So what does that mean you were able to get into a lower class or did you have to still stay in, in the same one? 
No, I normally compete at 93, and this time I competed at 83. So, okay. yeah, I, I made weight no issue. My official weigh in is 82.65 without any water cutting, carb depletion, or calorie calorie restriction the week of. Obviously, there's 13 kilos of body weight lost in the five prior months, but yeah. That's awesome. And, and I think too, because the, the takeaway there is that a lot of people think that when you do cut, like you are going to just lose a ton of strength. And it sounds with that, you were able to to maintain everything other than you said bench press did take a little bit of a hit. But like you said, that was what you had expect, expected going in to it. What were some things that you did maybe differently this time around that, that maybe helped you maintain that strength? Or did you even do anything differently to, to maintain that strength? It was definitely less total training volume for the power lifts. And I just let my bodybuilding training take, take care of that. And I was primarily just doing singles with a couple of back off doubles and triples. Anyone who's interested in kind of the approach I took, I would refer them to some of the podcast appearances, research, and uh, talks that Dr. Pack has done. He did his PhD on minimum effective dose training in power lifters. Great episode of Nine Culture if you want to listen to him, come on. And then also for people who really want to dive in, check out the 3D Muscle Journey YouTube. I, in my first contest prep log, I talk about the setup of my training. Essentially, I was really just focusing on the skill rather than trying to like accumulate volume, build work capacity, build specific hypertrophy. And I was like, look, listen, my primary goal is bodybuilding. So I will invest the time and energy that I can without actually taking away from that primary goal. And I did do a little more powerlifting training, training as I got closer. And I did do a competition taper where I basically took a deload on my bodybuilding work, which we'll talk about deloads in a bit, and, and where I then increased load and specificity and then took a day off training on Friday I normally don't do. And it was very, it was good. And I think the combination of all those factors, I, it's the best I've ever felt after a meet. So the Sunday after the meet, I felt great. Part of it was also that I, the meet was so big. There was a record number of lifters competing in North Islands. So the weight classes were competing at different times than normal. Typically when you're in the weight classes, I compete in 83 or 93, you're looking at an afternoon or evening competition. But this time I was actually competing at 8 a.m. So I basically finished around lunch. And that means I didn't get shitty sleep that night after the competition. Because what typically happens is you decide to you get all adrenaline rush and take some caffeine. Some people even do nose torque, ammonia, and then there's no chance of sleeping that night. <laughs> But I was ready to pass out and I slept well the night after the powerlifting meet. And because I hadn't crushed myself leading into the competition, Monday morning, I got back into it. I had a deadlift and a bench session and then a bodybuilding session. I felt, I felt, I didn't feel like I needed the week off from the meet, which I typically and historically do. Another thing was that I have not been training with caffeine. I've been really trying to preserve my sleep quality this prep because it's the biggest issue I had in 2019. Like the one thing I wanted to improve upon from what I think was my most successful prep in 2019 was I got to a point where for four months I was getting an after five hours of sleep. I don't think it was related to the caffeine. It was just related to the deficit, low energy availability, and just the reality of being shredded. But I knew it wasn't helping, right? So I've been training sans caffeine. And the only thing I have is just one cup of coffee in the morning, like five days a week when I eat breakfast, but not even ever, necessarily every day. That's just, that's not like intentional five. It's just what happens. So then on the day of the competition, I needed very little caffeine to feel stimulated. I think I had 250 milligrams total across all three disciplines. So that's not that much. And it got all into my system before noon because that competition ended early. So I think all of those factors together meant that this competition was the exact opposite of what I feared. I'm going to crush myself trying to do a powerlifting meet in the middle of a prep. But instead, it was this nice diversion that went surprisingly well. Yeah, no, it sounds, yeah, it sounds like it went really well. And I guess then the takeaway here with this too is would you change based on how you approached this powerlifting competition? Would you change anything like moving forward? Would you repeat basically maybe what you did? Obviously, may, probably not being a deficit ahead of time, but would you change anything uh, uh, like, yeah, with your approach moving forward? 100%. So when I plan to intentionally do this next year and see where I can go in the 83 kilo class, uh, the goal will actually be to come into the meet a couple weeks out around 85 rather than being 82.6 two weeks out, and then doing a mild cut of probably water load, water cut, slight de decrease in carbs, increase in fats, slight calorie deficit perhaps, and then the gut cut to reduce that, the bowel weight to come in. So that I'm actually walking around 85 or 86. And when I was 85, 86, like my bench was a little bit higher. I suspect my deadlift and squat, even though they didn't suffer, could be a little bit better. And then similarly, I would make sure that I wasn't in any kind of substantial deficit, like you mentioned. And I would also train 
more specifically for powerlifting. So I would, my, my best numbers ever are a uh, 227 squat or just over 500 pounds, a in competition standard 155 bench, which is like three, 344, 343 or something like that. And then a 260 deadlift, which is I think 572. So a good bit higher than this, but that's not where I started. So the goal will be for me post bodybuilding season to much more specifically focus on powerlifting, but also trying to see like how little can I do? It'll be more than this because I'm not doing as much bodybuilding training, but it won't be as much as I've previously done to hit those peaks. And it'll find a nice middle ground where I feel like I'm recovering well, but still improving so that when I'm coming into that competition, I'm still fresh. So it's basically taking all these lessons and then making it intentional rather than an ad hoc bolt on to a bodybuilding competition. Yeah, it you, you got away with doing less, but then like you said, you also didn't like necessarily hit like any PRs or anything. But part of that was just because, again, you weren't specific, like you're, you, as you mentioned, like you ahead of time made that clear that you wanted your bodybuilding to be like the main focus, right? Like you didn't want this to take away from that. And obviously that's going to come with, hey, it's probably going to see a little bit of a uh, detriment in terms of your powerlifting because that's not the main thing there. And with that, did you see any, did it affect your body composition at all, do you think? Or do you, you feel like you're pretty much on point there uh, with that uh, at this point? No, like it really didn't take away from my training or make my deficit harder or anything like that. Most so like I was doing towards the end, I did start including uh, an SBD day on, uh, on Saturdays that I would do in the morning. So squat, bench, and deadlift. And on those days, I had time for one accessory movement. But I still had basically Friday, Tuesday as purely dedicated bodybuilding days. And then on my Monday and Thursday, I would do squat, bench, or bench, deadlift, rotating. So three days a week in my training close to the comp, I had a squat bench day, a bench deadlift day, and a squat bench deadlift day. And how many of those squat bench or bench deadlift days just rotated each week. And then on those days where I just did two of the main lifts, I would do three accessory movements or bodybuilding movements. So if you think about it, if I have two full bodybuilding days, where I'm going in there doing six, seven, eight exercises all dedicated to bodybuilding. And then I've got two other days where I'm doing three exercises. And then I've got this Saturday where I'm doing one additional exercise. And it's not like the squat bench deadlift do nothing for me. It's just they're not the best use of time. It's an opportunity cost. I'm effectively doing the same thing as someone who's training four days a week for bodybuilding. And I would say that's perfectly fine, especially while dieting. Yeah, cool. And then as far as like now that you're done with powerlifting competition, how did, how has training changed for you now at this point? And I guess, yeah, just maybe a general update on like your nutrition and, and stuff like that now. Yeah. So now I'm just pushing to get leaner. And I'm doing training that is probably more optimized for retaining muscle and improving my physique. Uh, my nutrition is still steady the way it was. Sometimes when I have my higher days in terms of energy and take those precede the days where I'm training, what I think are my more important muscle groups. So like my shoulders, lats, things that make me look wider than my kind of narrower frame. And that's just going as is. The only thing that I, that I am not completely removing is if I want to do powerlifting next year, not doing any comp lifts from July all the way until I finish my season in November. That's not the play. But at the same time, I am also trying to focus on like having a really serious run of the, the, these bodybuilding competitions. I'm doing two super pro qualifiers. There's a show in Washington and there's also WNBF Worlds. And then I'm competing in the only events in New Zealand and Australia. So these are all very competitive shows where a lot of really good bodybuilders are going to be there. So I got to bring my A game. So what that means is a nice balance that's shifted a little further down from that balance between powerlifting and bodybuilding. So my goal is basically just to work up to a single at a moderate RPE once per week, once per lift. So we're talking about that takes me 20 minutes on squats and about five minutes on bench and about 10 minutes on deadlift with the kind of warm-ups I need to do to feel strong. And that's just going to be practice. And the goal is just to hold serve. Like I don't want to see my numbers decline much beyond just the effect of dieting right? Which is going to happen. I, I do know that once I'm like 79 kilos and depleted in the morning and, and getting 10,000 steps a day that I'm not going to expect to wake up and be like, oh, let's, let's put 200, 205 on the bar and squat that and, and have it move. There'll be days where 180 feels like trash. And that's okay because I know that's not related to my powerlifting skill. That's an acute state I'm in and that will rebound as soon as I recover. But basically now I'm really focusing on the minimum amount so I don't backslide, not the minimum amount to improve my strength for a powerlifting competition while bodybuilding or to offset the losses I might otherwise expect, but just like pure skill maintenance so that once I start post-season 
post bodybuilding season in November, I can actually really focus on building my total and competing in a series of competitions the next couple of years. So that's, that's like my idea is, Hey, what if we can actually qualify and compete in WMBF worlds? Then maybe crazy idea. See if I can do a, an IPF international comp. And I have various levels to, to deal with the fact that I'm a mediocre power lifter. Like top goal is hitting the qualifying total for the open 83 kilo WNBA IPF worlds in the next couple of years. That's like totaling 630 right now, which is not amazing, but I'm in a small country for New Zealand. And it's really just a stretch goal for me because I think it's potentially possible because at 93, I can total more than that. So a little bit off the bench, keep the squat and deadlift like I saw in this competition. That's not unreasonable. A step down from there would be a different international competition, but not quite world-class, something like Oceania or Commonwealth or the Pacific championships that New Zealand's a part of. And that would require like a 590-ish total. Step down from there would be like the master circuit because I'm 40 now. Master's Worlds is that the total that I've basically already hit. The standard drops off a good bit once you start having people retire. You just got to outlast them. Bro. That's what I'm <laughs> yes. telling you. And you get yep. relevant again. <laughs> Hey, stay injury yeah. free, right? Make sure that you recover, stay injury free. And like you said, just outlast them and and, you, and you'll make it to the top or at least 100%. close to it. No. Yeah. That's really cool. I love kind of hearing, you know, how you're making both work um, because, you know, you, you see people go all in on one, which is totally fine, but it's really cool to see how you can, you know, you can make both work. Right. Cause I do think people think it's this either or, uh, and, and again, like you certain phases of whatever you're doing that is going to require you to probably drop off one just a little bit, but it's, you're at least maintaining what you have and yeah, we're really periodizing it. And I think I, I just love kind of hearing about how you would manage that, but yeah, really looking forward to that. Is there anything else in terms of your prep or anything like that, that is it just, hey, just, just dropping body fat? Is there anything else that you're maybe look like you're going to implement like any type of like diet break? I know you already did when you did the powerlifting competition, but anything else like that? Or is it just how you feel and, and how things are progressing then at that point? Yeah, probably the most interesting thing to people, and this is something that I think not necessarily will fit with everyone's personality and certainly shouldn't be instituted until someone has the requisite experience, is that I'm not hitting targets on a day-to-day -day basis. I've been trying to change my language around this because saying I'm not tracking is a little bit misleading. I'm not. If you were to open up any of the, my fit, if you were to open Fit Genie on my phone or my uh, Fitbit app or, or my scale weight tracking app, you won't find any nutrition tracking data. So I'm not tracking, but that doesn't mean I don't know my calorie intake for the day. I can't not know that just because of my time spent in nutrition research, nutrition coaching, and also that I tracked from 2007 till 2011 every day. And I tracked during my preps after that in 09, 2011, and for half of 2019. So this year I decided, you know what, I think it'd be, I could do a better job if I gave myself more auto-regulatory ability. With some oversight, Alberto Nunez, my fellow coach and colleague at 3DMJ, he oversees my preps and he's like my coach. I consult with him and we think about a timeline. So I have outcomes I'm trying to get to, but how I get there, I get much more fine-tuned day-to-day and weekly ability to adjust. When I think it's time for a diet break based upon how I'm feeling and where I'm at, I do that. And it's all about thinking, really, when it comes to bodybuilding and reaching extreme levels of conditioning that move you up a placing from, oh, that dude shredded to, oh my God, I didn't know that was possible kind of conditioning. It really comes down to surviving and not feeling like shit too early. I'm in a conditioning right now that many people would be like, oh, you're stage ready. Maybe for classic, I don't have striated glutes yet, but I have split hamstrings and I'm lean everywhere else. But I'm probably going to be trying to get striated glutes by August when I'm four or five weeks out. That's the kind of conditioning I'm going for, right? To then improve from there. So I can't shoot my wad in July when I've got to compete September all the way through November because I need to have that reservoir of will to dig, right? So... I think that's the big change of why you see more people getting into better shape and even first timers and in the modern era compared to say 10, 15 years ago when I first got into the sport, it's that people knew how to grind, but they didn't know how to do it in such a way that enabled them to grind efficiently. So they could will themselves to looking stage ready, but that, that, that proposition has cap. It shouldn't be a willpower battle. It should be how much of my will can I preserve so I can take it even further. So by making it feel easier on a day-to-day -day basis and mathing it out, it allows me to push myself further. It's like progressive overload, right? Your reward for lifting heavier weights is, guess what? It's going to be just as hard because now you can lift heavier weights. It's not like you're going to 
you're like, oh, I can bench 225 now. So I'm just going to bench 135 and make it feel easy. It doesn't work like that. Well, yeah. So it sounds like you're, just so I understood that. So basically you're trying to make sure that you're not like getting too far ahead of it right now, essentially. Is that kind of what you're saying there? So then that way you, same type of thing with the powerlifting where it's, you don't want to injure yourself and find ways to keep yourself going. Kind of same concept here where you're just, like you said, not making sure that you have enough willpower deep into the prep when it really gets e even tougher, essentially. Yes, exactly. That is pacing. I'm making progress at an appropriate rate, but trying to do everything I can to make it feel as easy as possible in service of that. How are you feeling at, at this point? Do you have, are, you said you're pretty lean. Like you said, most people would say that you're ready to, to hop on stage at this point, but you have a little bit more to give. So are you starting to notice some of these things that pop up when you get super lean like that? Or to be honest, I've never felt this good during prep. It's definitely working. And it is surprising how good I feel, which is one of the things that gives me confidence about competing in the 83 kilo class moving forward. At the level of leanness I am now, if I chase a large deficit, I do feel it. For example, if I'm trying to clock 1,700 calories multiple days in a row while clocking, you know, close to 10,000 steps, I'll wake up in the middle of the night after four to five hours of sleep. I'll feel hungry and food focused before meals and I'll feel lethargic. Nothing bad, but something that, but I notice it. But if I ease off the gas a little bit, get closer to 2,000 calories, take my steps down to 7,000, just go slower when I can. Or if I give myself a diet break, all that goes away immediately. So it's at this stage, I'm not so lean that just living has a negative impact. It's the combination of being lean and the deficit at the same time. And it has to be a slightly larger deficit to where I actually seem to, seem to get those negative impacts. And contrast that back when I was in the high 80s or even mid 80s or the, the or low 90s. I could crush a very low deficit with high steps and I'd still feel normal. I'd just get a little, maybe a little blood sugar. So there's two interacting variables. And then also, are you good at kind of the behaviors and, and how attached are you to your off-season foods and the hedonic eating aspects? And I'm a very boring person who's been doing this a long time. So those things don't really bother me nearly as much as just the actual physical sensations and uh, physiological disruption of sleep and things like that. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's good to hear. So it sounds like maybe giving yourself a little bit extra time than what you think it, it is also like maybe an effective thing to do as well too there, just like, so that way you can maybe allow for it to be a little bit slower and, and things like that. And then too, I would think that another benefit of that too is obviously going to be from maintaining as much lean body mass as possible too. A hundred percent. And then you get to eat up into your shows. So if you're ready four weeks out, it's not, oh my God, I peaked early. It's, this is awesome. Now I get to increase my calorie intake and decrease my steps as I go into the show, trying to be as least dieted as possible. And you see pretty substantial improvements in the way one looks and the uh, decreases in the variability in, in the way you look on a day-to-day -day basis because you're not, you're recovering from muscle damage faster. You're having more regular bowel movements. You're sleeping more regularly and your mood state is, is more uh, regulated. And you don't necessarily have to bet on rolling the dice on a carb loading protocol because you're not depleted in the first place. So you can do much more subtle changes the week of competitions. And it also makes it easier to have back-to-back -back competitions. Like I'm literally competing yeah. three weeks in a row for my first shows, September 30th, October 7th, October 14th. Um, I can't be doing like a rapid backload on those three weeks or it would mess up the next one. So instead it's get ready early, walk your carbs up and have an extra 30, 40 grams, 50 grams maybe on the Friday before a competition, eat light on the day and just get back on it on Sunday, fly out to another location and do it again. That's not something you really can do if you are just barely in condition and you need to like, and you feel like, and even though I don't recommend this, like you need to deplete and carb load and manipulate a bunch of stuff just to time it just perfect. So you look good on Saturday and then somehow and get it together to do it again the next weekend. And then even doing that too, it's, there's still going to be an inherent risk with doing any sort of like peak week thing as well too, because you don't really know exactly how you're going to respond. Or I think people think that there's this like magic peak week protocol out there and that's not the case. It is very dependent on, on, on the person as well too. So that takes that risk out of it as well. So awesome. Really looking forward to uh, seeing how the, this prep goes for you. It sounds like it's, you're setting yourself up for it to be the best one yet. So looking forward to that and here in a couple months, two and a half, what? A little over two months before your first show. I think you said the end of September, correct? And then running all the way to November. So that's right. Awesome. Next time we have you on, we'll be able to check in with that and, and, and see how it went there. So cool. Let's dive into some of the, like some new research that came out from a hypertrophy standpoint, and then we'll wrap up with any new research that you have coming out. So a couple new studies that I feel like have been getting a lot of 
I've just been seeing a lot of stuff on social media about it. And so the first one's this training to failure research for, well, I think it was for strength and hypertrophy, but by Robinson, Zach Robinson from Data Driven Strength. I know there was other people on that paper, but I know you had him on Iron Culture to talk about it. And so I'm just curious to hear your takeaways from it. If there's anything else that you want to share about that, like particular study or, or anything like that. I think it's still in pre-print, correct? I don't know if it's actually, I could be wrong on that. No, 100% correct. It's a series of meta regressions, which if people don't know what those are, probably heard of an analysis where you take two variables and you see how they plot. And you can get a very strong correlation, for example, between height and weight. Typically, taller people weigh more, right? So you have a strong correlation. And a correlation done more complex with multiple different things considered, you can call that a multiple regression. And a meta regression is when you're actually regressing or correlating the data multiple studies all together and giving them their individual weight and then deciding whether is that just a linear correlation or potentially some type of non-linear correlation because not all variables necessarily increase to just a straight line mathematically, right? For example, height and weight don't. They actually start to, to change that relationship as you get taller because you're dealing with three-dimensional space. So that's just an interesting little background. So that what they did was a series of meta-regressions. Essentially what they were trying to do was they were extracting from all the research where it could be extracted, either from velocity data, where the people actually reported RIR, uh, or where it could be extrapolated in a failure versus a non-failure training group, where they did a percentage of 1RM using the average number of reps you can perform at a percentage 1RM, or in cluster set training based upon one group versus the other and assuming, okay, if they did a cluster of one at 85% of 1RM, maybe they could do five more. So the other group did six reps to failure. What the RIR was, in every single one of these studies. And then they plotted continuously. So they did a continuous relationship between the repetitions and reserve. So how far from failure you are and the hypertrophy response. And this is a really novel way of meta-analyzing the data on training to failure because every previous meta-analysis, and there have been three that have been published. Uh, myself, I was part of the one right prior to this one led by PhD candidate out at Deakin University, Martin Reflo, who's a part of JPS Health and Fitness. Really good student, honored to work with him. It was a binary analysis. So is failure or non-failure producing more hypertrophy? And in that meta-analysis, we did multiple subgroups. So we compared different definitions for failure against failure training, and we compared different velocity losses, which is like a more continuous examination. But we still had to have these threshold cutoffs. So it's this binary decision is one better than the other. That's not the same as a continuous analysis, which you, which you get with a regression, which increases your sample, your statistical power, and it also gives you a more nuanced understanding of a relationship rather than just A versus B comparison. And yes, this is a preprint. Robinson led a team out of Florida Atlantic University. Robinson is one of Dr. Mike Zerdos' PhD students. He has a few. I actually have the privilege of being on Zach's uh, PhD committee. So I'm one of his committee members. Um, and I'm also a committee member of, of numerous folks coming out of FAU. I've actually got three, including Zach, PhD candidates who I'm on the committee of. I'm actually a, an adjunct faculty member, basically a distance, non-paid advisor for their research school. So I have the privilege of working with Dr. Zoros and a lot of those students work, and they're doing some really awesome stuff out of FAU. And the three PhD students currently in that program also form the core members of Data Driven Strength, which is a really great group of guys. So that's Jake, Josh, and Zach all in the midst of doing their PhDs. It's a pretty cool thing to see for me as the elder statesman and the science practitioner realm to see that become much more and much more common. You have people who are athletes, coaches, and researchers really trying to synergize all this knowledge together. So anyway, that's the background of what a preprint is, like you correctly stated, Jeff. This is something that's part of the open science movement. And open science is a movement pushed by researchers to make science much more transparent, higher quality, and more easily disseminated and taken up by the people who are interested in it. And in the case of sports science, that's athletes, coaches, fitness trainers, and, and people who are trying to improve their health and fitness, right? And one of the methods in the open science movement to achieve that is what's called a preprint. So this is before it's gone to peer review, which is a really important thing to remember that this has not been officially peer reviewed, but it is getting the whole intention of a preprint. The benefit of it is to get community-based peer review. So people talking about it on podcasts, like you and I are doing, part of it. We're part of open science, bro. Yes. Um, exactly. Um, and to have it also being written about and having blogs and social media posts. So for example, in the mass issue that's coming out in the 1st of August, I'm not sure when this podcast is going to get released, but if it's in the past, the future, 
definitely check it out because the two articles that I've written for the August issue of Mass, I wrote a review of Plotkin and colleagues' hip thrust versus squat study, which is a preprint. And I am also writing a review of Max Coleman out of Dr. Schoenfeld's lab, Deload study, which we're going to talk about, which is also a preprint. So these three preprints are in the perfect example of why it's important to participate in open science and get preprints out there because they're getting a lot of questions from the community. And it's not like the preprints are, are going to remain unchanged. All these podcast discussions, research reviews, social media posts, communications with the authors, that's going to potentially result in meaningful changes to the manuscripts before they get submitted to formal peer review. And the reason why this is also important, in addition to just making sure you take into consideration the whole community's questions, comments, potential misinterpretations, et cetera, is also, in addition to all that, that it takes forever to get to peer review sometimes. So when you submit something to a journal, they are either going to desk reject it, the editor goes, that ah, doesn't fit our scope, or they're going to run it through peer review. And running it through peer review can either result in getting uh, immediate acceptance, which almost never happened, or anywhere from minor to major revisions, and then mission, potentially more minor major revisions and eventual publication. And either way, it's going to take a long time because if you get rejected, it either never comes out or you're going to submit to another journal and have to go through that process, which takes time. Typically, the fastest you're going to see something get through peer review is from when, when you complete the study and you write the manuscript, you have to get it in the right format. You submit it. We're talking three to nine months. Very common. Three months is fast and uh, nine months is slow, but not super slow. And sometimes it takes longer than that. It takes a full year. And importantly, that's after writing the manuscript and analyzing the data. So we're, I just submitted to a journal the weight gain study that we were conducting from pre-COVID through COVID, and we actually finished in 2021. So only submitting that now because getting all the data together and dealing with all the analysis and addressing all the dropouts and the staggered starts and all of that is quite the process. So that's probably an example that got lengthened by a couple of years because of COVID. So it's a a bad example, but if, if, even if it had been started in 2018 and we published it in 2020, it's still, oh shit, like you started the data collection two years ago and two and a half years later, it's getting submitted to peer review to then be in peer review for up to a year. So by having a preprint, you can cut sometimes up to a year off of that time period to actually disseminate the findings to people, just so long as they know that the findings are preliminary because they haven't been peer reviewed. So getting back to this, the, this analysis, I think it's really important, and I'm parroting Zach here because he did has done a really good job communicating this, to understand that there, the primary thing we can learn from this relationship is that there does seem to be a relationship between training closer to failure and hypertrophy. While previous meta-analyses, because they were not continuous, indicated that there was no large significant difference between training to failure and not to failure. And that if you get somewhere in the ballpark of failure or just simply train hard enough, you get similar outcomes. That is still true. It didn't give us an indication of what's the difference between, say, a 5IR or 2IR. And while we can't give an exact magnitude based upon, you could actually extract it. You can actually see the effect sizes for each RI. The, the data is not precise enough for us to do that for practice. But we can say the closer you get to failure, the more that set will probably produce a stimulus. And what we also can't say is, therefore, you should take all sets to failure, because we have to think about it in the context of what was analyzed. And 90% of these studies where they're actually extracting this data is people training two to three days per week. Yet 90% of the people who are interested in these findings are training four to six days per week, right? And the amount of volume that's performed in these studies where they're analyzing failure is probably what most of us in the practice field would consider low to moderate. And... They also did a lot of really cool things called moderator analyses. So when you're creating uh, an analysis like they did, you're fitting the observations to some type of curve. So you're trying to model, create basically a explanatory relationship that accurately describes what is being seen in the data. And what they found was this nonlinear curve where in general, as you get closer to failure, greater and greater hypertrophy. And then in their nonlinear model, which had the best fit mathematically, you saw an uptick where it got disproportionately better as you're moving closer to failure from, say, the zero to two RIR range that had a steeper curve, if you will, the relationship with hypertrophy than, say, the three to five RIR or the five to three RIR range, right? So, anyway, that's the best fit model. And to then figure out, okay, what fits the shape of that curve, that's when you can start 
changing which study you include, right? So you go, okay, I want to only include the studies that equated reps, or I want to only include the studies that equated sets, or I want to only include the studies that used heavy loads, or I want to only include the studies where they did concurrent training, or they had people who were trained or untrained, et cetera. And the really interesting finding, and this is for hypertrophy specifically, we haven't even touched on the strength data, was that basically every single moderating variable, or the vast majority of them, decreased the strength of the relationship between failure and hypertrophy. Meaning that we can't just say that all these effects are additive. We can't go, oh, I got Schoenfeld's meta-analysis from 2017 saying that we do more volume, that increases hypertrophy. I got Robinson's meta-regression saying we clear in closer to failure, we get more hypertrophy. Easy. I do all the volume and all this to failure. Perfect. When you actually had a moderating effect and you looked at the relationship of volume, so basically how, whether you're equating for reps or sets, that weakened that relationship. Meaning that we have to view the training stress variables, primarily the total amount of work you're doing and how close it is to failure, as interdependent. You don't get to just pu pull all the levers and get this additive effect. If you're going to do a very high volume program, you probably will have to give a bit on proximity to failure and vice versa. Same potentially true of just the total number of, uh, of days per week you train. And actually the strongest out of all of these variables was relative load. So when they specifically analyzed studies where it was over 77.5% of 1RM, 80% of 1RM or higher. So we're talking about like your 8RM loads or lower. The relationship got way weaker when you were looking at proximity to failure. So now it seems to not matter if you're training closer to failure. And this kind of makes sense when you think about it. If you load an 8RM, your first rep is at a 7RIR. And the primary analysis they did was looking at a 0 to 10RIR. So if you're doing a 5 by 5 with your 8RM, that is probably, you shouldn't think of that as just 3RIR training. Oh, that's worse than 2 or 1 or 0RIR. That's probably just as good as doing something that was closer to failure with a similar amount of volume, uh, which has been confirmed by other studies. So I think that's a really important understanding there is that all of these variables seem to impact us. We are only meta analyzing, we are only looking at a meta -ana analysis of the studies which were included, which are primarily low frequency and low to moderate volume protocols. Our conclusions are limited to that. So an accurate conclusion of this would be if you're training with a low to moderate volume and a low to moderate frequency for the goal of hypertrophy, you're probably going to get better results when you're training close to failure. But if someone asks, what is it better to increase volume or to be training closer to failure? Can't know from this analysis. Uh, what we can know is, hey, if you're training heavy and you're training with higher volume, importance of going to failure is going to be a lot less. And we can extrapolate from other data that you're probably pushing your fatigue in a nonlinear way up now that really needs to be considered. So that's the hypertrophy stuff. The strength findings were also really interesting, although they've been getting less press because I think they're less surprising, that at a given load, which is an important element of this analysis, so whether we're, whenever we're comparing 70% of 1RM to 70% of 1RM, or 85% of 1RM to 85% of 1RM, or 80% or 90%, but not when we're comparing 90% of 1RM to 70% of 1RM. So that's an important way this analysis was done. Proximity to failure does not seem to impact strength gains. So that means if you throw two groups doing 80% of 1RM, whether they're doing doubles or whether they're doing sets of six, probably not going to make a difference with everything else held constant as far as who's getting stronger. It's the load on the bar, specificity, that's going to dictate strength. And if anything, there was a slight, probably non-meaningful relationship between having poorer strength gains and going to failure, potentially just from fatigue, maybe speculatively from fiber type conversion away from 2x, although I don't necessarily think that's probably playing a major role. And the failure does seem to have more like metabolic and hypertrophy benefits rather than strength benefits largely related to load. And also that was moderated by other effects as well. And it could actually make that relationship with strength even worse. So generally it confirms a lot of things we already knew, but maybe just a little more nuance. It's definitely not a game changer. It's definitely not saying that you should train to failure or that all oh, this whole time train to failure, we've always known it was better. Because the funny thing is the last two or even three meta-analyses, even the one I did with Reflo, while there was no significant differences favoring either group, all of the data like leans towards failure being, if anything, negligibly better than not training to failure. It's just not tipping over for significant, meaning that you can get 
noticeable and significant, meaningful hypertrophy out of training, far from failure. And you even saw positive findings at the 10 RIR. And that probably has to do with a lot of the subject population that we're dealing with. There's plenty of studies on trained lifters, but there's also plenty on untrained lifters and more of them. And yeah, if the progressive overload for you is going from doing, I'm getting off the toilet to I'm actually going to put a bar on my back. Training to a 10 R is going to be something that'll actually stimulate gains in both strength and hypertrophy for you. So it's important to remember that you can get robust hypertrophy and robust strength gains far from failure. You probably can get better hypertrophy gains training closer to failure. And we understand that relationship a little more clearly. And it doesn't plateau off at 5 RIR or something like that. But it's within all of those caveats in confines of what was actually meta-analyzed. Yeah, no, I mean, as, as you were explaining that and everything that I've heard, it, it seems like it, like you said, it just reaffirmed everything we knew where it was like with strength, it's pretty specific in terms of what you need to do to progress that. Whereas like hypertrophy, it's like you have this big, there's just a lot of different variables that you can mess with. And, and I guess the big takeaway with that would be, it almost sounds like finding what what's enjoyable for you and what you can stick with is probably going to be the, the biggest thing there. Also considering, hey, if you can only train three days a week, that's going to alter it. But just say you have the option of whatever it is, like you have a lot of wiggle room there essentially with what you can do. Well said. I totally agree. I think it's a perfect way of positioning it. Yeah. Which again is good. I think it's nice to, because then you, because people do fall on this. Is it volume? Is it the, the intensity? And it's, you have a lot of different things that you can mess around with here. Does it, does this change? I guess I have two, two follow-ups to this. The 10 RM thing that you mentioned, that was like, I'm assuming untrained lifters that they saw like that growth there was more like untrained lifters or what did that not specify that or... So the initial analysis, because you, when you create a regression, you can plot it all the way to the end of, of the earth. You could calculate a, a, a 100 RIR, but having no data on it, just looking at the curve from what it does exist. So it really depends on what studies were out there. And there were, most studies fell in the 0 to 10 RIR range, but the further you get from failure, the fewer number of studies you have. So the less confidence you can have in that point estimate. If you look at some of the earlier graphs, it's all the way out to 23 RIR or something like that. But they went, look, we're just going to limit this to the 0 to 10 RIR for a principal analysis because that's where there actually is data. But I would have probably more confidence moving from, say, 5, 6 RIR to 0. Essentially, when you look at the graphs, you can see what the actual line is, which represents fitting the mean. And then you can see the confidence bands around it. And they extend to actually being above 0, so some growth but they extend both ways and they get wider the further you get from failure. And they probably are influenced by studies on, uh, on but we're training not to failure. Sometimes produces better outcomes, sometimes produces worse. Yeah, I think it, it is, it's difficult to say exactly why that is the case, but in terms of the actual practical application of this, I think, yeah, probably being at a 10 RIR for hypertrophy for a well-trained lifter is not something I would recommend. It's difficult to think about how that would produce an adaptation unless it's a novel exercise and a rep range they're never used to. Yeah, I think it, it is very challenging to go, where's the cutoff of where this does or doesn't matter or what will be sufficient to maintain or produce some gains or produce optimal gains. And I think all we can say at this point is that if we isolate just a set, even though the study did include multiple sets across multiple days, but is in the context of low frequency, low volume, low total amount of training relative to what a lot of people do, being closer to failure does seem to produce more hypertrophy. Yep. And, and would that, did this change anything in terms of how you would program or, or is it pretty much, like you said, it's just reaffirmed what you already thought uh, with everything? It's pretty similar, to be honest. I do think that people need to think about interactions with other variables, like certain exercises don't lend themselves towards training to failure, in my opinion. You have to think about what's the weak link, what, what muscle is actually yeah. that's the thing that's probably getting closer to failure as you do this. And then what are your goals? And how do you like to train? So if someone who likes to do the quote unquote power buildery thing, this may not change anything for them. If they want to do like that example of what I gave five by five and a three RIR is probably not sacrificing anything, even though three RIR might be like triggering people when they look at this analysis. But I, I, I really would caution people towards focusing too much on that nonlinear increase at the end because there are, th this is a, this is not a really super clean data set, but it is a very high powered data set because they did a great job working for a year, more than a year, picking apart all these studies to try to extrapolate RIR values. But they are, yeah, I think I would encourage everyone to check out uh, social media 
and all the podcasts he's done on this topic because I think he can communicate it even more effectively than I can. He can speak to those limitations. But you, but, uh, sorry, I was just going to no, say, no, no, that's it. I was going to say you guys did on Iron Culture, you guys had Zach on and he's also been on Revive Stronger too. So if you haven't checked that out yet, definitely check those two out. You guys went super deep on, on this topic. You did mention the deload one with Max Coleman and Brad Schoenfeld's lab. I guess you would call this lab. I'm not sure. Or research team. I don't know what, I don't know what you would call it, but they had their, the deload one. And I'm just curious to hear maybe the quick summary of the findings. And then if that has changed anything for yourself in terms of like deloads and how you would implement those. Yeah, so really cool study. Shout out to Max Coleman. Yeah, they got a preprint out, same deal. And this is a pretty, I would say, elegant, simply designed study. Elegant just means it's, it's, it doesn't have a lot of confounders. We're just looking at a very specific research question. And they took trained individuals, split them into two groups over a nine-week training period. And essentially, one group just went in week five. Guess what? You're not training. The other group trained straight through. And they looked at hypertrophy outcomes in the quads. They trained them twice a week, hard in the gym, doing Smith machine squat, like basically lower body training. I think no hamstrings, but it was like uh, calves, quads primarily. And then they got to do upper body training on their own. Reasonably high volume, I think 20 sets per week on, on these lifts, training to volitional failure. So zero to two RIR in most cases is what that's going to result in. And doing the right things. And then they looked at hypertrophy outcomes, ultrasound. They looked at strength outcomes. So dynamic one RM on the Smith machine squat, as well as uh, isometric strength uh, on leg extension. So that's at a fixed angle. It's like skill-free strength, if you will. Basically, if you set up a leg extension midway through and you couldn't move the pad and you just pushed into it as hard as you could, then we measure the actual force output at that joint angle. So isometric strength, dynamic strength. Uh, they also mentioned uh, measured quote-unquote muscle power. So that's jump height and measured muscular endurance. So that is leg extensions for reps at 60% of your body weight at the start of the protocol and seeing how that changed. And they also took a readiness questionnaire. So that asked them, how do you, basically, how do you feel? Uh, and they, they did that after the four-week training mark. And then they did it after the nine-week training mark. So they got this two, two different groups. How did you feel? And again, only one of those groups took the deload. Now, the really important limitation that I think should be stressed is that the way this deload is implemented is a full week off of training. That's simple, that's clean, but that's not exactly the same as what most practitioners would recommend, where they're typically reducing volume to some degree. So the deload research is essentially non-existent until now, but the adjacent deload research and the practice of deloading is largely informed by the tapering research. Now, a taper and a deload are close cousins. A taper is a reduction in volume while you roughly maintain intensity and you do it before strength testing or before a competition. And this is consistently shown to maybe increase like 1RM strength or different measures of strength or power by 2 to 4%. Nothing major. But we're talking about a one-third to two-thirds reduction in volume while maintaining load. We test your strength. Boom. Good to go. Now, training cessation is what this study truly is. They took seven, a full week off of training. Okay. Now, we look at the training cessation literature. That can improve strength, it can have no effect on strength, or it can actually decrease it, depending on how, how long it is. So there are a fair number of studies on this. And when you look at the tapering versus the training cessation research, you typically see that training tapers more consistently increase strength. And if the training cessation is long enough, say longer than three days, sometimes it actually results in small decreases in strength. So that's important to know. That's why I'm planting a seed here. So what the heck did they find? They found basically equivalent hypertrophy in terms of these two groups. Uh, when you look at the actual plots of the group differences, there none of them are, are, are meaningful uh, in terms of the differences when you look at the, uh, the, the quadricep and calf outcomes, which is what they measured in terms of hypertrophy. So if I wanted to frame this positively, doing 90% as much training, take a week off compared to a group doing nine weeks, didn't harm your gains at all. If I wanted to frame this negatively, we could look at the rest of the data. And there was a slight, uh, slightly poorer gains in strength in the group that did the deload or the training cessation. Uh, 1RM strength was affected to a small degree and uh, metric strength was affected to a moderate degree. Also, at the nine-week point, so the post-test of the training questionnaire of asking how much readiness they felt, uh, they had significantly higher muscle soreness than the group that did not take a deload. And when you look within group, you saw that their training motivation actually went down significantly from week four to week nine, while the group that just trained straight through, there was no change 
I don't think that was actually a between group uh, difference, if I recall correctly. But n those are notable findings. So the overall summary is that if you take a nine week block of training, upper lower four day split, and you give one group a mandatory week off on week five, no matter what, they're going to get probably similar hypertrophy. They might come back feeling a little funky on strength, and they're going to potentially not feel as good. That, that's what, what was observed. And when you look at the anecdotal reports and the discussion, that's exactly what some people said. They came back not feeling as fresh from the deload, not feeling as motivated. And the hot take on the internet is, oh, deloads are trash. And I think that's, that, that is, again, one framing you could have. Oh, it's the same for hypertrophy, worse for strength. Why would you ever deload? And the probably more accurate take, is, or, or if I want to frame it positively, yeah, you can take a week off and it won't hurt your gains. And this was a training protocol designed for hypertrophy, right? I think neither one of those is, is completely encompassing the accuracy of these findings. I'm not surprised by these findings at all. I mentioned earlier, I planted that seed comparing tapering to time off. And there are indeed studies where you take time off from training and it actually hinders you if you do it long enough. For example, there's a study by Travis, skeletal muscle adaptations, performance outcomes following a step in exponential taper. And there are other ones where they look at training cessation, where you can see that there are like losses of strength from taking too long of time off. And I think that's just important to acknowledge. The tapering research, which is where you just reduce volume but still train, increases strength. So I think there's another reality where they decided to just maintain the same training schedule but do half the sets. And we saw the opposite, similar hypertrophy, but the deload group got a little bit stronger. And then the whole narrative changes. And that shouldn't happen, right? The narrative shouldn't change based upon just one study with these relatively minute findings for what is honestly a secondary outcome because these d protocols were designed for hypertrophy, not strength anyway. So I, I just think that's really important for people to realize. And I think in practice, there's a couple things that, that people do differently than was done in this study. They typically reduce volume in some way or they reduce, reduce training stress in some way. They give themselves a quote unquote easy week instead of taking the full week off. Uh, additionally, you will see much more frequently auto-regulated deloads or quote-unquote reactive deloads where you don't have someone deload no matter what after four weeks. You have them talk about their training motivation. You look at their soreness. Uh, you look at their performance. Is it going up or going down? That's a big one. And you talk to them about aches and pains. And then you have some way of assessing that qualitatively or quantitatively where if there's a threshold of, of what you think is fatigue going on that might be counterproductive to your goals, that triggers a deload. And that could happen every four to nine weeks or 12 weeks or something like that. But it's individualized and it's auto-regulated rather than preordained at a given time, regardless of whether you feel like you need the deload or not. So yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge, again, just like we could only conclude certain things from that meta regression of what was included in it. The only thing we can say is that in this group on average, uh, there was minor negative impacts on strength, their strength dropped. This didn't go up as much compared to the group that did not do a full week of training cessation in the middle of a nine-week block. So it's not a vindication or a, a damnation, if you will, of deloads. It is a training cessation study. And the findings were relatively expected, in my opinion, if you look at other training cessation research. Yeah. So it sounds like the big thing there with that was the deload was they just didn't do anything, which like you said, most people aren't typically going to do that. Obviously, if they have a vacation or something, they might do that. But that's not how a typical deload is. Like every single time you're going to deload, you're usually doing, like you said, something people are just going to back off. But um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because that's my, what I, from it, like what I took away from it was like, from a deload standpoint, it's, it's not that deloads aren't necessary at this point. It's just they probably should be a little bit more reactive and based on auto regulation and how you're feeling versus, hey, it's four, it's the fourth week. This is the last week. We're going to deload next week. And, and so that was the, what I took away. So glad to hear that that's what your thoughts were on it. Cool. Was there anything else from this that maybe we missed or anything like that? Or you think that pretty much summed uh, that one up? Yeah, I, I just want to make that point even clearer that the tapers and training cessation, and therefore we would think deloads and training cessation shouldn't be seen as the same thing. There's nothing wrong with taking time off as a way to deload, but just understand that what might come with that, that if you take a trained lifter with relatively, I would say, refined you know, like motor patterns in a given skill, and you give them time off, it's not the same as 
taking time off when you're a newbie. So there's a study, the effect of three versus five days of training cessation on maximal strength by Travis and colleagues. And the three-day group saw basically no loss in strength, but the five-day group saw like a small decrease in isometric bench press strength, like 2.3%, which makes a lot of sense. And the important thing in that study that I just cited by Travis, it was on 19 powerlifters. So they're all well-trained members of a university powerlifting club. Now, contrast that to my experiences when I was, say, like a personal trainer at the Y. I've got a soccer mom that trains with me two to three days per week. They take a one-week vacation. They come back. They're the same or stronger on all these mostly machine-based exercises we're doing. But I take a complete week off of training the power lifts. They're going to feel weird when I come back. I'm not going to be able to hit the same numbers. And that's a consistent thing I've seen as a strengthening, like a powerlifting coach over, over time. So I think there's more variables at play here. And these findings actually fit nicely in line with, with the rest of them. We do need more research on this, though, because there's a lot of interesting concepts at play, like the concept of resensitization. So the idea that if you desensitize to the stimulus, that you might be able to reset your ability to grow faster. That's been explored in a few studies, but I do mean a few. There's two by Ogasa, and there's a recent one by Jacko, where they look at basically untrained individuals, they look at untrained individuals who have a period of detraining and they see that when they return to training in Sawara studies, they get to the same place as the group that didn't take that time off, indicating that the rate of gain after a period of training cessation is faster, but they don't actually supersede the other group. And in the study by Jacko, they actually saw that hypertrophy was maintained. And then when they came back to training, certain anabolic signaling pathways were upregulated. So like the take home is, oh shit, if you then, if you keep doing that, you're going to start to beat the other group. But we haven't necessarily seen that. This study is probably too short to really get at that and train lifters. So what I would love to see, like a follow-up study for whoever wants to take the baton from Coleman is to then run another cycle. So we've got now a 13 week study with two deloads, right? And one group is doing the training cessation. But another group is just dropping volume by 50%, mm -hmm. right? You just come in once. It's an easy study to do. So this is an easy way to do it. You come in for just one, one lower body training session and you do one body training session on your own, right? It's an easy way of dropping, dro dropping volume by 50%. It's just do half of the session since they were just repeating the upper body session twice and repeating the lower body session twice. And then see what happens. And then, okay, cool. That tells you something. And then the next step would be, okay, let's try... A fixed a fixed deload group, deal group versus an auto regulated deload group, and it gets more and more complicated to to really uncover these things. But it's important to know that we there's no way a single study can tell us everything we need about deloads. But this is fantastic work by Coleman and colleagues working with Dr. Schoenfeld. So shout out to all of them over at Lehman College who are setting the stage for future research. And they and you have to have a study with all its inherent limitations that any single study has before you can start building on top of it and extrapolating more and more findings. So this is a useful piece of the puzzle to where we know that if you don't have to take a deload when you don't feel like it randomly in four weeks, and you shouldn't expect magic things to happen in a nine week block. I think people have to ask themselves the question, do I expect taking one week off in the middle of a nine week period for trained lifters to really show much of anything in a study? Or did I have unrealistic expectations about the positive or negatives of having one training cycle, like two mesos with one deload. If you were expecting magic things to happen from the study, I don't think you had realistic expectations in the first place. So yep. great place to build from. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely. It's yeah, just one finding. And, and like you said, now we can just build from here and, and, and keep finding more. But yeah, no, I love those takeaways. It's just, again, it's an option. Like it doesn't mean deloads are bad. It's just an option and, and, and do it more so when you feel versus doing it. Hey, this, I have to do it here. So again, I think both of these studies probably gave us just more options than anything, right? Versus, hey, this is exactly how you need to do it, which for some people probably isn't what they want to hear. But I think if anything, hey, it gives you options, which I think is always a good thing. Again, we don't have to, if you have a trip or something like that, you can go take it. You don't have to worry about losing a ton of gains or, or anything like that. Cool. So obviously we're over an hour now, so I want to be respectful of your time. I know you mentioned the weight gain study. I know we had talked about that a couple of times. Is that, I know you said it's getting there. Any Anything else on, on that side of things before I let you go? Yeah, that is currently in peer review. Maybe I should have done a preprint as well on that just so people could be reading about it. In fact, why didn't I? What have I done? I'm not participating <laughs> in open science. But yeah, so that one's going to be a while before that's out. That's just the nature of, of, of publishing. But it's done. It's out. It's cool. So that's exciting. Watch this space for nine months. 
And then we're also working currently on the manuscript where I was stretching myself with a stretching device to try to replicate what Warnicky and colleagues did for my calves, where I did that for 12 weeks with a four week lead in and then a one week measurement period after I'd stopped stretching it and went back to like lower calf volume. That case study on me uh, currently being written up and we're probably going to submit that. This one we might, now that we're talking about, I'm like, hey, maybe we should just submit this as a preprint. But it should be easy to get, not easy. It should be fast to get through peer review because it is a case study, which are typically short, punchy. It'll be like 1500 words. And I don't anticipate it'll take forever to peer review. But even if we might want to do a preprint, I'm not sure. We might not just because it's so short. So I'm going to be a bad boy and not, not <laughs> participate in open science for these two. But in the future and in the past, we've definitely done preprints. So those are the two ones that are soon to come out from our lab specifically would be the, the weight gain study that we ran through COVID and then also my own personal case study on my calves for stretching them. But lots of cool stuff that my students are doing. A shout out to Colby Souza. We've got a, a pretty cool interview series, or I should say survey with coaches asking about how they implement intra-microcycle recovery. So basically training configuration. Do they have quote unquote power days or low volume days to potentially potentiate performance within uh, you know, a week. So not necessarily a deload that you do after a mesocycle, but what do you do within a meso a microcycle to monitor recovery, enhance performance on specific days? How do you make sure your strength days go type of deal? And then he's got some research that is going to be coming out soon where we're actually testing that empirically, bringing people in with different quote unquote active recovery protocols, lifting and non-lifting and seeing how that impacts their comp their performance on a strength day. Kedrick Kwan, we're going to be publishing his research on different weight cutting strategies and how they impact strength so they can directly influence what powerlifters do. Kim Santa Barbara, who did her whole PhD looking at the menstrual cycle changes across training in, in female strength athletes and competitors and non-competitors. And the variability there is really interesting. And also how a simple mind-body intervention can impact those, those symptoms. Easy yoga during certain phases of the menstrual cycle might be something that are interesting. Those are all coming out. Sohee Lee, comparing circuit training versus traditional training. Those are coming out. My students are killing it, that's what I'm saying. We've got Kai Homer, who's in the midst of looking at the first crossover trial, so actually empirically testing the effects of a carb load in people who are either competing or are basically in the same position as a competitor. They have to be lean enough. They have to be dieting. They have to be trained. They come in, they do a a carb load or a placebo that they figure out pretty soon. It's placebo because it's all <laughs> liquid shakes on top of their diet with carbs or no carbs. And then pictures, which we're going to send to physique judges, ultrasound, skin folds, girths, asking them what they feel like, having them assess their own physique when they look at the pictures afterwards, the effects of having a pump up and not a pump up. Very cool. And we've also got surveys with what bodybuilders do in peak week and how that impacts them. So lots of good stuff coming out in the coming year, led by my students. So yeah, lots coming out of AUT. It's going to be an exciting couple of years of publishing, very relevant applied sports science data to strength and physique sport. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to all those. And yeah, this busy couple of years for you getting, getting these ready to go. Anywhere where the audience, where you want to lead the audience to, to find you? Honestly, I think just because of what we talked about, I would highly encourage people to check out. You can absolutely go to massresearchreview.com. And from there, you can, if you're interested, you can sign up. We do have a lot of free resources there if you're not, and that's all good. Uh, but I am specifically, like I said, reviewing in the August 1st issue, not only the deload study uh, by Coleman and colleagues, but also the hip thrust versus squat comparison with MRI data, the gold standard for hypertrophy that uh, did a really good job out of, out of Auburn. I believe that's Mike Roberts lab. So yeah, Plotkin did a great job on that. We have a really good future generation of researchers. Plotkin's doing his PhD. The guys at Data Different Strength are doing their PhD. My students are doing their PhD. Max Coleman, he's like I said out there with Schoenfeld. And then we also have the, the long muscle link guru himself out there at James <laughs> Steele Lab, Milo Wolf, yeah. <laughs> along with PAC. All these guys doing their PhDs. And they're all people who train hard, love lifting, are interested in themselves, but are also coaches and are also researchers. So it's this great convergence. It's the way I've always wanted it to be where the in the trenches experience and the science feed into each other and everyone's better for it. So this kind of rising tide lifts all ships idea where we're not siloed. And I think we're getting closer and closer to that with every year. 
Awesome. Yeah. No, Mass, 100% back that up. I love Mass. I, I read it every month. So I always look forward to the first of the month uh, when, when all those come out. Dr. Helms, thank you again. Uh, a ton of great information here as always. And we will chat with you next time. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. 